Thanks very much, Jenny, for the introduction, and uh, thank you to all your all the participants for uh, putting up with me for another another webinar. Um, so, what I want to talk about today is um, what happens when we heat milk at high temperatures, and and what are some of the consequences of that. Um, so, I just want to start with a bit of background on thermal processing. Uh, and then talk about processing in the 90 to 150 degree range, because that's what I've chosen as the, the high temperature range that I want to talk about. And there's, uh, I want to talk about the, the effect on bacteria uh, and then, of course, the, the chemical changes that occur uh, during that, that, that heating. And I'll concentrate on proteins, uh, lactose and, and vitamins. And then I'll just give a few conclusions at the end. So I guess thermal processing, as we as we all know, is the most widely used uh, technology in the dairy industry. Uh, I guess we all are very familiar with pasteurisation, uh, but that's not the only only uh, thermal process that's used. Uh, but certainly the most common in Australia and and throughout the world, and it's been used for a long time, and it's uh, one of the uh, the the best known and best um, uh, used. Uh, processes in, in the world. So minimum conditions for pasteurisation, 72 degrees, 15 seconds. Most, most companies use a higher temperature than that or, or a slightly longer time. Of course, you can use a lower temperature, longer time, 63 degrees for 30 minutes, uh, which is called the, the holder method or the batch method. Uh, either one of those is designed to kill the most heat-stable non-spore-forming spore forming, uh, pathogenic bacteria, and the ones that are targeted are Coxiella benetii and Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Originally, it was um, Mycobacterium tuberculosis was the target, and then they found that Coxiella, which causes Q fever, was slightly more um, heat stable, and so the uh, conditions were were set for for killing Coxiella uh, as well as Mycobacterium. Now. Pasteurization doesn't kill all bacteria. Uh, some thermophilic bacteria uh, are not killed. Uh, so this includes spores, but not only spores. There's some thermophilic uh, non-spore forming bacteria that are not killed as well. But virtually no spores are killed by, by pasteurization. Pasteurization doesn't cause much chemical change in milk. Uh, very small amounts of uh, change, but not that um, we, we would notice, and has very little effect on the, the sensory, the taste, uh, or the nutritional qualities of, of the product. But then we get to the higher uh, temperature processing, and as I said, I'm, I've defined that for this, this webinar as 90 to 150 degrees. Um, so it includes... Um, uh, various processes that are used. And the first three there are used for, for milk, uh, for different types of milk, extended shelf life milk or ESL is now, is now called, uh, processing in the, in the range 125 to 134 for uh, say four to 10 seconds. And then slightly higher conditions, uh, uh, more severe conditions, uh, UHT processing 135 to 150 for one to 10 seconds commonly around 140 for a couple of seconds. Uh, and then container sterilisation, that's a lower temperature, longer time process, 110 to 120 degrees for 10 to 20 minutes. And then we have um, some more processes to use for particular products. So in yogurt manufacture, um, usually a, a, a preheating step of 90 to 95 degrees for five to 10 minutes, uh, heating the, the yogurt mix at those uh, under those conditions. And then there's a preheating for various um, uh, powder manufacturers. Uh, for skim milk powder, 90 degrees for 30 minutes, 30 seconds. Uh, for medium heat powder, 90 degrees for five minutes for, for high heat powder and higher still more than 120 degrees for more than 40 seconds for what's called a high, high heat powder, very, very highly heated powder. And also for whole milk powder, 90 degrees for 30 seconds. Some of you might be thinking, well, what about low heat powders? Well, low heat powders are uh, preheated at 
the temperatures um, much less than 90 degrees, so they, they're not included in, in this. And then we have the, the forewarming or preheating uh, in production of sterilised concentrated milk. And various conditions are being used for this, but they're, they're in the range 93, 93 degrees for 30 minutes up to, say, 117 degrees for, uh, for a couple of minutes. So what I want to talk about um, now is just a little bit about the destruction of bacteria and then get on to the chemical changes that occur and uh, what consequences they have. So the heating additions for those three first ones that I mentioned, uh, ones that are used for milk, they're primarily, primarily designed to kill bacteria. For ESL milk, uh, that's all non-spore forming bacteria and some spores. And the recommended can, minimum conditions are to kill spores of psychotrophic spore forming bacteria, keeping in mind that ESL milk is kept at refrigeration temperature. So it's only the, uh, the ones that, or only the psychotrophic spore forming bacteria, which are likely to cause uh, problems uh, under those conditions. And then for UHT milk, well, we're, we're aiming to kill almost all bacteria. Uh, and the minimum conditions there are to, to cause a nine log reduction of the spores of thermophilic um, spore forming bacteria. That is, those uh, spores which have which are very heat stable, and those conditions are, are defined by this index called B star of one. So a B star of one is this nine log reduction of thermophilic spores, and then in container sterilization, again all bacteria, including spores, and the minimum conditions there. And this is this comes from uh, from the, the canning processes which have been in operation for a long time. Uh, the minimum conditions are 12 log reduction of spores of Clostridium botulinum, sometimes called the botulinum cook or the 12D cook. Uh, and that has an F0 of three. And a lot of you will, will be familiar with um, F0 as a uh, corresponding index to that of, uh, of B star. Now, I just put this graph in here just to show you the effect of temperature on on the destruction of spores during a UHT process. Now, this particular process has a total B star of 2.34, uh, but you'll see the contribution to that 2.34 at various um, temperatures, uh, well, varies with the, uh, with the temperature, obviously. Uh, you'll, you'll notice that the, in the region of uh, 90, 95 degrees, the preheat section, uh, this, this section here, oops, you can't see that. I'll just make my pointer. Make the pointer. So this, this region in here, 95 degrees for about 30 to 60 seconds, has virtually no effect on, on spores in, in that, um, that section. This section here um, contributes almost a bit, a bit over half to um, the total. Uh, but that's quite a long section. And then we've got this section up here, the, the holding section, four seconds, and that's um, contributing uh, 0.76. So it's quite a significant um, amount uh, over a very short time. And then this, the, uh, the cool down contributes uh, a little bit as well. Interesting to note that um, it's the high temperature of the short time which causes the, the, the big, big change in, um, in the effect on on bacteria, and when we a bit later on, I'll just mention um, the effect of uh, chemical change, and that's quite different. That the the um, uh, the lower temperature, longer time, has a bigger effect on chemical change than the higher temperature for for a short time. Mm -hmm. So some of the chemical changes I want to talk about, and as I said, I'll talk about the changes that occur, and then I'll talk about the, the consequences of those changes. And so the changes uh, that I want to talk about in proteins, the denaturation of whey proteins, uh, casein coagulation and dissociation from casein micelle, inactivation of enzymes, and cross-linking of proteins, and then in, in lactose, the maillard reaction and lactulose formation 
and then of course a bit on vitamins and i suppose a lot of people would would think of vitamins as a first thing when they talk about um when they think about the effects that that um, high temperature might have on the components of milk so firstly denaturation of whey proteins so this is dominated by denaturation of beta lactoglobulin or the unfolding of of beta lactoglobulin which is the definition of of denaturation because beta lactoglobulin it's a 50 to 60 percent of, of whey protein so it dominates the the effect uh, what happens when we when we heat um beta lactoglobulin we get some free sulfhydryl groups being exposed there's one one free sulfhydryl group in 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 beta lactoglobulin which is usually hidden usually not exposed uh, but heat uh, opens the the, uh, the molecule and exposes that SH group. It also exposes some hydrophobic uh, sections of the molecule, which can have an effect later on as well. Now, heat also degrades some of the sulfur amino acids uh, uh, to form volatile sulfur compounds. Um, so these are mostly hydrogen sulfide, methane thiol, and dimethyl sulfide. Um, Dimethyl disulfide also forms um, when methane thiol is, is oxidized um, during storage. <clears throat> uh, and the denatured whey proteins interact with themselves and they form, form complexes. Um, and they also interact with, with caseins and particularly uh, kappa casein. So what are the consequences of... of um, denaturation of whey proteins well firstly uh, heated milk has a cooked flavor we all know and the higher the temperature and the longer the time the more cooked flavor we get and that's particularly due to those sulfur uh, sulfur compounds that i mentioned before um, hydrogen sulfide methane thiol and methane uh, dimethyl sulfide and i'll put in a comment in there that you get more of these things from from whole milk than you do from from skim milk because the milk fat globule membrane also has uh, sulfur amino acids which break down to, to give uh, sulfur compounds. And the interaction of whey proteins with, with casein um, causes a, a few things. One is a whitening of UHT milk, and you'll notice this most with skim milk. You, you don't notice it so much with uh, with whole milk because of the, of the, uh, the fat globules there, but um, it's certainly uh, noticeable with skim milk. It um, reduces the action of rennet on casein. The, the casein um, it gets basically covered with uh, uh, whey proteins and, and so it's not accessible to, to the rennet, um, the enzyme. Uh, so it's very difficult to make a rennet or cheese uh, from a high heat treated milk. So if you take UHT milk, it takes a long, long time to, to coagulate to make a make a decent cheese, or it's, it's almost impossible. And you also get an increase in, in the viscosity of yogurt, and that's why um, we heat uh, yogurt mix, mix to 1995 degrees of five to 10 minutes. Without that, um, yogurt would be a lot, a lot thinner. Now, I mentioned that... Uh, uh, Whole milk powder is produced under the same conditions as medium heat skim milk powder. And the reason for the higher temperature, you might expect that, skin, that whole milk powder would be uh, made under the same conditions as, as low heat powder. But in fact, the higher um, heating conditions uh, produce sulfhydryl compounds and these have an antioxidant effect and hence reduce the oxidation of the fat during storage. So that's, that's a quite a significant effect. And the last one there is uh, classification of skim milk powders. Uh, all the skim milk powders are, uh, are classified according to how much undernatured whey protein. So not, not the amount of denatured whey protein because you can't measure that as easily as the undernatured whey protein. So the low heat powder, which I haven't talked about, uh, more than six milligrams per gram of powder uh, through to much less than one and a half grams for the high, high heat powder. So that's um, that's very much a consequence of of uh, protein denaturation. So the next one I want to talk about is casein coagulation uh, and dissociation. 
Uh, as we know, caseins are much more heat stable than whey proteins. Whey proteins start to denature around 70 degrees, uh, whereas caseins are, are quite stable up to about 140 degrees. Um, in regular milk, and that's with a pH of, say, 6.7, um, the caseins are stable up to at 140 degrees for a, for a 20, even up to 30 minutes uh, in a really stable milk. So, But you'll notice that I'll put in there a pH uh, around 6.7 because this is very dependent on, on the pH. So uh, the uh, over, over a pH range, the heat stability of, of milk um, and of the caseins varies quite considerably. So heat stability tests are... Uh, are performed at 180 deg 140 degrees for single strength milk and 120 degrees for concentrated milk. And again, they're, they're at a particular uh, pH um, and they uh, a stable milk uh, should, should last about uh, 20 minutes before it starts to coagulate. Now, heat also releases kappa casein from the casein micelle, and, and the, the more the heat, the more kappa casein is released. Uh, I just put in there a, a, an example. Heating at 90 degrees for 15 minutes releases about 30% of the kappa casein into the milk serum. And, of course, once it's in the milk serum, it can interact with, uh, with beta-lactoglobulin. Some of the kappa casein on the casein micelle can also interact with with um, uh, with beta-lactoglobulin as well, of course. So what are some of the consequences? Uh, uh, so as we know, the heat stability is very closely related to casein stability. So once casein stability is, is decreased, um, and it decreases in, in various ways, uh, particularly during storage of products, um, including milk, uh, so it will um, it will coagulate um, at a much lower and a much lower temperature or, or in a shorter time. <clears throat> uh, so de destabilized casein can coagulate during uh, high temperature heating, and that happens more regularly with uh, more, more readily with concentrated milk. So that's why uh, concentrated milk uh, heat stability is done to 120 degrees. The complex uh, between beta lactoglobulin and kappa casein, which is formed during heating, um, that makes the whey protein insoluble. And this is um, the basis for measuring uh, WP and I, the whey protein nitrogen index of skim milk powders uh, to classify them. Okay, I want to talk about uh, enzymes. Um, of course, enzymes are proteins. So, uh, there are a lot of native enzymes in, in milk. I'm not going to talk about the non-native enzymes in milk, ones that are introduced in bacteria. Now, a lot of those are much more heat stable than the native milk enzymes. But um, I've got a list of native milk enzymes here, and this is taken from a <coughs> excuse me, a, um, a review that I, I published a couple of years ago. And um, I've put the line in there for 90 degrees, and you'll see that only a few of the, the enzymes are, are stable over, over 90 degrees. So most of the others are inactivated um, at less than uh, 90 degrees. So the, the ones that are, uh, are stable at 90 degrees are uh, acid phosphatase, which can have, have an effect in, in cheese, uh, and proteases, the three, three different proteases, plasmin, plasminogen activators, uh, and cathepsin D. And then there's a few other ones that um, are stable. I just want to talk about plasmin and plasminogen activators because they 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 have um, uh, major consequences. So in some UHT um, processing, uh, particularly under um, indirect, uh, sorry, under direct processing conditions using steam injection or steam infusion, some of the plasmin. Um, and plasmin, plasminogen activators don't get inactivated, so they they remain active in the in the milk during storage. And of course, um, UHT milk is stored at room temperature uh, over a, a long period of time, so only a small amount of those enzymes there can have an effect. And what happens during storage is that 
some of the plasminogen in in milk, and this, that's a, a precursor of plasmin, is is converted to plasmin, which is the active uh, protease, uh, by plasminogen activator. So that's that's um, plasminogen activator is one of the the heat stable enzymes in milk. So that's when you can get proteolysis and breakdown of of the proteins. And of course, proteolysis in UHG milk can cause uh, bitterness and can also cause um, age gelation. <clears throat> so that's uh, that's quite important. Uh, more severe UHT heating, uh, particularly using uh, indirect processing, that's tubular or plate um, heat exchanges, uh, inactivates these proteases and and um, and so you can prevent bitterness and age gelation if you use those conditions. But of course, if you use um, indirect processing, you get a lot more chemical change and by chemical change, um, you can read um, flavour change. And so you get a lot more cooked flavour with um, indirect heating, particularly if, if it's uh, severe enough to inactivate the proteases. The last one on protein um, uh, protein effect is uh, cross-linking of proteins. Uh, now, protein cross-linking can occur through a reaction with dehydroalanine. And I'll, I'll talk about another one later, but this is this is uh, dehydroalanine. It um, <clears throat> it reacts with lysine and forms what's called an isopeptide or lysinoalanine, uh, which is a link uh, between the proteins. Now, this dehydroalanine is not not um, present in uh, in in milk um, normally, but it's formed by heat um, from um, from serine or cysteine. Or phosphoserine, and the, the heat on serine uh, removes uh, water, on cysteine removes hydrogen sulfide, and on on phosphoserine removes phosphate. So each of those three um, reactions produces dehydroalanine. Now, the dehydroalanine uh, production uh, occurs much faster at as uh, a high pH. So I'll, I'll mention that because it's important for what I want to say in a minute. So what are the consequences of protein cross-linking? Well, the formation of um, um, lysinoalanine uh, reduces the amount of nutritionally available lysine. As soon as the lysine is tied up um, with um, dehydroalanine in um, LAL, uh, it's no longer nutritionally available. So you reduce your nutritional uh, quality of, of the product. Um, and dietary um, lysinoalanine has been linked to, um, to medical issues, uh, particularly in experimental animals. Uh, but I, I've added there that uh, the amount of LAL in, in milks heated under the normal conditions is, is very unlikely to have um, any health effects. Um, but um, the reason why it was uh, discovered and uh, and people got concerned about it was that it was found to be high in um, in caseinates um, uh, years some years ago, um, and the caseinates at that time were being made by roller drying, which was uh, a high temperature process, uh, and of course caseinates are at high pH because they're um, they're, they're made by adding. Um, alkali to uh, to casein, so so there was the ideal conditions for producing LAL at high pH and um, and high temperature, uh, high temperatures and and um, and quite severe heating. Okay, so the Maillard reaction. Some of you might remember um, I gave a seminar on the Maillard Maillard reaction some time ago. Um, it involves three stages of, re of reactions. Uh, the first stage is uh, a reaction of lactose with uh, amino acids, particularly lysine, uh, but also um, arginine, methionine, tryptophan, histidine uh, can also be involved in the Maillard reaction. Uh, the first stable product of, of the reaction is, uh, is lactulose or lysine. <clears throat> uh, the intermediate stages um, form compounds such as hydroxymethylferferol, HMF, uh, and dicarbonyl compounds, and also flavor compounds. 
And the final stage, uh, and this is the one that I guess a lot of us um, re- uh, associate with the Maillard reaction, produces melanoidins, which are the brown pigments. And so you get a brown discoloration of the, of the product. It also produces what's now being called advanced glycation end products. Um, so these are AGEs, um, one of which is carboxymethyl lysine. Now, I'll just talk about those in, in a moment, but um, uh, if we just look at the, the consequences of myeloid reaction, lysine, I'll only, uh, uh, whoop, go back a step, lactulose or lysine forms furosine when, when we digest it with acid, and that's what's done when we analyse milk um, to um, to produce furosine. Uh, furosine is very widely used as an index of the severity of heating, particularly in UHT milk. Um, and it's a it's a good index of freshly uh, produced um, UHT milk. So there's no furosine in in milk uh, per se. Uh, it's only produced from uh, that lactulose lysine, the first uh, stable product of the Maillard reaction, uh, when we digest it with acid uh, during the analysis of the milk. A lot of people talk about furosine in UHT milk, but in, in fact, uh, milk does not contain furosine. Now, the lysine, obviously, in lactulose, the lysine is, is also blocked and um, un, unavailable nutritionally. Uh, the word blocked is used um, to uh, to indicate that basically the enzymes uh, can't get to the, to the lysine to, to utilise it. So this is a consideration in infant formula, but um, infant formula uh, has um, a very high level of uh, whey proteins, uh, and whey proteins are, are very rich in in um, in, in uh, whey proteins. So it's um, sorry, whey proteins are, are rich in lysine, and so there's always more lysine there than um, than what's uh, what's necessary. So uh, even though it's a consideration, and and some some infant formulae have quite a high level of um, of blocked lysine, it's not um, not not nu- nutritionally detrimental. Uh, HMF, hydroxymethyl furfural, is also used as a chemical index of heating. Um, it's uh, it's not as good as um, lactulose, as I'll mention a bit later on, but it, it is used. Uh, and, of course, you get flavour compounds formed by the mild reaction. Some of these uh, contribute a lot to the flavour of UHT milk. UHT milk flavour is, um, is affected by the sulfur sulfur um, compounds but also by uh, some of the products of the products of the maillard reaction such as maltol um, diacetyl and furfural so uh, they're they're quite important now the other one i haven't put on there um uh, just by mistake was that um uh, the the advanced glycation end products the ages as i mentioned in the previous slide uh, they've been linked with various um, uh, health issues, uh, but the the jury is really still out as, as to whether that's they're very significant in, um, in in heated dairy products. Oh, I have got them here. Sorry. <laughs> um, so the dicarbonyl reaction products I mentioned; um, these are the ones formed in the intermediate stages. Uh, glyoxal, methylglyoxal, um, they've each got a, uh, two carbonyls, obviously, from, from the uh, name, and they're very reactive compounds and they can link up um, proteins. Um, and when they do that, they can uh, decrease the solubility of, of powders such as milk protein concentrate. And there's, I've, I've mentioned, the advanced glycation in products. Um, and, of course, the, the highly heat um, uh, processed products uh, can can go quite brown. Um, in container sterilised milk is noticeably brown. UHT milk is usually not brown unless it's really been um, severely heated, but um, in container sterilised milk usually has that brown tinge to it. Because the brown colour is a feature of some products, and I've, mm-hmm. I've uh, shown you there um, the heated condensed milk, which is very, very popular in, in South America, um, called dolce de leche. 
Um, it's um, available everywhere in South America. Uh, it is pre produced in Australia, but um, only in small quantities. Now, lactulose formation um, is another consequence of, of heating milk. Um, so the lactose is epimerized. It's made into a, an isomer of, of lactose. Um, and that isomer is um, lactulose, which is a, a disaccharide uh, composed of galactose and fructose, uh, as opposed to lactose, which is a disaccharide composed of galactose and, and glucose. So <clears throat> uh, lactulose levels increase with the severity of heating, um, severity of heating up to, say, 700 milligrams per litre in UHT milk and, and much higher in, in container uh, sterilised milk. <clears throat> So I just want to show you this, this graph here. It's just the same process as um, I showed you for destruction of spores. And you'll see again that there's very, very little um, effect of, of this temperature around 95 degrees on lactulose formation, but it increases as we go up here. But you'll see that there's not a huge increase at this at the holding time. Uh, or the holding in the holding tube compared with um, the effect on spores, but a lot of effect here in the, the lower temperature, longer time heating. So this is a, just shows you the the, uh, the different chemical and bacteriological effects of of high temperature heating. But again, um, virtually no lactulose formation uh, below the 90, 90 degree line there. What are the consequences of lactulose formation? Well, lactulose is um, it's an ideal chemical heat index. So, so the higher the temperature, the, the more severe the, the heating, the higher the amount of uh, uh, lactulose is formed. Uh, now, it's not present in raw milk, uh, but increases with the severity of heating, and, and it changes very little on storage. So mm -hmm. that makes it an ideal um, index because um, any... Um, any um, lactulose there is coming from heating and it's not um, being formed during during storage. <clears throat> so, so furosine, as I mentioned, was another commonly used uh, chemical index, but it, it increases during storage. And I mentioned HMF is also a chemical index, but chemical heat index, uh, but it also changes during storage as well. So neither of those is as good a, an index as um, as lactulose. And I just put in there a point of interest. Lactulose is a laxative. You can buy it in the in the chemist shop. There's a little bottle there. I show you that you can you can get. So it's used for treating constipation. But I also added that the levels that you'll get in heated milk are unlikely to have any laxative laxative effect on you. Okay, uh, vitamins. Um, as I said, a lot of people would think of the destruction of vitamins as a as the most common effect of um, heat treatment, which is not necessarily true. Uh, firstly, the fat soluble vitamins, that's A, D, E, and K, they're not really affected uh, by high temperature uh, or high heat treatment of milk. But some of the water vi vitamins are water soluble vitamins, um, and of course the effect increases with severity of heating. Uh, so in UHT milk, the loss is around up to 10% for all the um, the B vitamins. They're the ones that are most likely to, they're the, the water-soluble ones, uh, except folic acid. Um, and, and vitamin C is also quite unstable, but um, we don't drink milk for its vitamin C content, which is very, very low. Uh, and the losses there are about 15 to 24% of folic acid and and, uh, and vitamin C <clears throat> or ascorbic acid. Now, if we go to in-container sterilised milk, which gets a lot more severe heat treatment, uh, the losses of some of the water-soluble vitamins are, are in the 0-30% range rather than 0-10% for UHT milk. But for folic acid and vitamin B12 and vitamin C, um, much higher uh, losses um, occur. So... It's really only the severely heated product that um, uh, that we get a lot of destruction of, of vitamins. So 
So what are some of the consequences? Well, I suppose it's pretty obvious that um, destruction of vitamins is going to reduce the nutritive value uh, in severely heat, heated uh, milk products. I just put in the destruction here of thymine, which is vitamin B1, is the basis of the chemical index, um, chemical heat index C star, which is used to describe the amount of chemical change we get during UHT processing of milk. So uh, nobody mentioned, nobody measures the destruction of thymine, but it's, a, I guess, a theoretical construct. Uh, and a C star of one is defined as equivalent to a 3% destruction of, of thymine. And that um, is equivalent to heating milk at 135 degrees for 30.5 seconds or the equivalent conditions, um, say 140 degrees for three seconds. So that's um, that's seen as a, a, a maximum severity for UHT processing. But um, as I've mentioned uh, here, in most commercial UHT plants, uh, the particularly those that are using um, indirect heating like tubulars, tub, tubes or plates, uh, the C star is much greater than one. But for direct processes, uh, steam injection and steam infusion, where we're getting a lot less heat heat damage, um, there's, uh, the C star is always much less than one. So C star is a, is a pretty good ind indicator of the amount of chemical change that's that's occurring uh, in in the in the milk um, in container sterilization of course because it's uh, much more severe heating than UHT uh, of course B stars much higher than one uh, in the five to six region for example okay so just some conclusions um, uh, Heat treatments in the range of 90, 90 to 150 degrees used to produce several products in the in the dairy industry. Uh, and in addition to destroying bacteria, which is the main target for, uh, for our treatment of, of milk, um, they cause numerous chemical changes. And some of these chemical changes are beneficial, um, even essential, uh, but others are detrimental. But the detrimental effects on nutritive value and safety of heated products is really only significant for the very uh, severely heated, um, high heat treated products. So with that, um, I'll, I'll conclude and thank you for your uh, your attention. I've, I've added a, a few references there. My apologies for, for citing my own uh, papers, but um, they happen to be the most significant ones for, for this, uh, this webinar. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks so much, Hilton. That was great. Um, folks, yeah, we've got a couple of questions up there already, Hilton. So if you'd like to um, read them out and answer them, stop sharing your screen. Stop, stop sharing my screen, yeah. yeah. Hilton loves a good question, folks. So keep them coming. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to find the okay. chat. There we go. Okay. ADPI heat treatment classification was based on 36% protein, as is in SMP, but has not been updated since Codex permitted standardization of milk. Ah, right. This means that some low heat powder based on 36% protein would move to medium heat based on a protein adjustment. Uh, should, the, should the classification be restated based on a protein basis to avoid these inconsistencies, uh, confusion in the application of WPNI for milk powders? Ah, well, Patrick, you obviously know a lot about uh, uh, heat classification of, of powders. I can, I can see your point there, uh, but um, I, I wouldn't like to, um, to give an opinion as to whether there should be any, any sort of change there, um, but it's a very good point you make. Hilton, who would make that decision to change it, do you know? Uh, well, it was as... Um, as Patrick's pointed out, was the ADPI, this is oh, right. the American, okay. American Dairy Products Institute. Yes. Um, so we, we're using their classification, basically. So mm. unless they change that, I don't see us changing it here. Mm. Okay, so Patsy has got a question there. Is there a correlation of, of uh, gelation? Milk and, oh, yes. due to fat Just pregnancy. please read it all out. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yes. Is there a correlation of gelation in UHT milk concentrates um, due to fat protein ratio, uh, <clears throat> I can't 
quote you chapter and verse on that, but I I doubt that there would be a would be a, a correlation. Uh, gelation is much more likely to occur um, in uh, in concentrated product than in in um, a normal strength product, and it's um, it's usually not related to proteolysis like it is in in um, in ordinary milk, but um, whether there's a correlation with uh, fat protein ratio, um, I, I really couldn't tell you. Okay, so Francisco has got a question. Uh, after whey protein denaturation, what main factors dictate the pathway whey whey or whey casein uh, interaction? Okay, um, that's. Um, that's a good question, and I don't know that there's a simple answer to it. Um, one of the the debates that's been that's raged for a long time is whether the um, whether the way whether the beta lactoglobulin reacts with kappa casein on the on the casein micelle before it leaves the casein micelle or after it leaves the casein micelle. Uh, but um, uh, what main factors dictate the pathway? Oh, um, I'll have, have to think about that one for a while. Um, well, I could give hmm. you, I can put you in touch via email if you like. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good question. And I, I don't know what the, what the answer is. Okay. So, so I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Well, we'll see if any more can be done there. Right. Yeah. Well, so, good, good questions. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Too good. <laughs> okay. So just while we're waiting to see if there are any more questions, um, I am currently organising the program for next semester, so we welcome your suggestions, please, of new topics or speakers you would like to hear from. That would be good. I'll just pause the rig again. Okay, so um, with that, I want to thank you sincerely, Hilton, for today's webinar, and we look forward to seeing you again next semester. Okay, thanks, Jenny. I'll, I'll certainly do that. Mm -hmm.